Hi, my name is Dale Comstock. Uh, I spent 20 years in the Army as a Green Beret, as a Delta Force operator, um, as a paratrooper, infantryman, and a scout in the 82nd Airborne Division. Spent nine and a half years working for our government as a paramilitary contractor as well. Um, so I've seen uh, and done a lot of things in terms of combat and the use of weapons over the years. Uh, participated in every campaign from Grenada to present wars abroad in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, some of you may have known or seen me on uh, television before. I was on Stars and Stripes last year on NBC with Terry Crews. Um, I was on uh, Discovery, Channel, uh, Discovery Channel's One Man Army. Um, and actually, that's how I got discovered from NBC was uh, through that show. I have a book out uh, that, that I published July 4th. It's called American Badass. Um, the book is not about being a badass. Um, it's actually, if there's such a thing, it's about being a good ass. Um, it's a book that uh, I wrote to inspire and mentor young people, especially young men, the new generation, and I use my life stories as a medium to do that. Um, what I'm here to do is help uh, to show, show our, our youth, our, our young men and, and women um, that uh, there's a better way in life and that you can be a good citizen, a good patriot, um, a good father, a good brother, a good husband, um, and still you know, have fun and, uh, and, and do the things that you want to do, that you don't have to be uh, you know, what we term as a, we think of as a badass in this country, um, as being someone that's a derelict and always in trouble. That's not true. A real badass is someone that can do very good things um, and is accomplished and uh, is focused. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of story about a story about my wife, um, Miroslava. Um, she goes by the moniker Little Amazonian. In fact, you can go to her, uh, her fan page, uh, thelittleamazonian.com, Miroslava. And uh, what I want to talk about is a situation that happened to her a couple years ago after I got out of the uh, out of the service. Um, I was on a business trip, and one night about 10:30 in the evening, someone cloned my garage door opener and broke into my house while I was away. Uh, my wife was in the shower. And I had, at that time, we had an infant daughter that was uh, in, uh, in a bedroom asleep. So over the uh, intercom system, um, my wife got an audible notification that the laundry door had opened and, uh, and that there was obviously an intruder in the house because she knew at that time I was in uh, the state of New Jersey. Um, so immediately she jumped out of the shower and she hates when I tell people this, but she was actually butt naked, didn't get dressed, didn't get dried off. She ran into the master bedroom, grabbed her cell phone, uh, dialed me and then I, from under the bed pulled out a uh, AR-15 Bushmaster rifle. Um, you know, some people would call it an assault weapon. Um, well, you know, back in the Civil War, you know, when we had muskets, uh, those could, be, could have been assault weapons too. So it's not really an assault weapon, it's a rifle. In this case, it was actually a carbine. And uh, so she grabbed the weapon and then I'm listening to her on the telephone and she moved down to the second floor landing. We had a three story house, so she moved to the second floor landing and basically took up an overwatch position over the living room. Um, and as I was listening and uh, she was telling me what was going on, the intruder had actually moved down the hallway. Uh, she heard his footsteps and as he was around the corner, she basically told him to stop. Uh, and if he didn't stop, and I will use her quote, she said, I have a gun, I will shoot your head off. And it was at that point, he turned and ran out the door. Um, she hit the emergency alarm on, uh, button on the alarm and then uh, basically chased him down the stairs through the laundry room out into the garage where he closed the garage door opener, uh, closed the garage door uh, with the remote uh, garage door opener and basically escaped. Um, two weeks later, the same guy came back again, um, 5.30 in the afternoon to try to come through the front door. Um, my wife had the door chained and when he pushed the door open, you know, obviously the chain stopped him momentarily and gave her enough time to react, go back, get her handy AR-15, and uh, again, he engaged the man at the door. He slammed the door, ran across the yard, jumped in the car, and, uh, and took off. So to this day, we have never been able to catch the guy, but in two weeks, uh, on two attempts, he tried to enter the house, knowing that one, there's an alarm system in the house, two, he also knew that she had a weapon, and three, he obviously knew I was gone. Um, so anyways, the moral of the story is, um, she had the option to pick up a handgun. I have several 45s laying around the house to include a 12-gauge shotgun, but we had actually trained on it before I had deployed, which we always do, and uh, we decided the, choice, the weapon of choice uh, for self-defense in the home in that scenario was our carbine, our AR-15. Um, since that time, um, we, uh, because of that, uh, that situation, it made me start thinking about weapons uh, for self-defense for women. And, uh, you know, some could argue, well, you know, a pistol is a good self-defense weapon or a shotgun. And there's, you know, there's pros and cons to all those. Um, but I decided that uh, it made more sense for my wife to have a carbine um, with a large capacity magazine, at least 30 rounds. In fact, the one that she used that night had a double stack 
uh, of magazines. So she had basically had 60 rounds of hollow point ammunition in that particular weapon. Um, so, you know, what we did decide to do, or what I decided to do is uh, design a weapon um, for women, for self-defense, not necessarily a range gun, although it could be a range gun. Um, and what I had in mind was the average woman that doesn't have a whole lot of time to go out and train to become an expert shot. Um, so the weapon, when I designed it, you know, I, I consider everything from lasers to gun lights to reflex sights on the weapon to, you know, I want to have a certain amount of uh, trigger pull on it. So one, she didn't have a negligent discharge, and two, that she wasn't crunching the trigger so hard that she was now jerking the barrel around and, and throwing rounds. Um, it's got things like ambidextrous safeties, magazine releases, um, and even the coloring on it is very unique. Um, she has a cryptic pattern on it that uh, has a kind of a fuchsia pink uh, type coloring, uh, color scheme to it. So, but everything about the weapon, including the sling, it's a two-point sling, allows for her to, one, effectively engage a threat without actually having to mount the weapon in her shoulder if she doesn't want to or cannot. For example, let's use a scenario where She's trying to get out of the house um, and she has my daughter in her, in her arms um, or maybe she has her in hand. So all she has is one hand to work with. Uh, you know, try doing that with a handgun and shooting accurately over five to ten meters, especially when you're moving quickly or down some stairs. So having the weapon slung with a two-point sling, she can actually fire it from the hip with the lasers on and the gun light and do that probably pretty, uh, I think, pretty accurately. In fact, I know she can because in my house, what we do is we actually set up IPSC targets around the house on the different levels, and I actually run drills with her. We practice clearing corners, shooting around furniture, so she knows the distances, known distances in the house and what she can engage. And she knows she can do all that because I actually use a laser bore sighting system, um, a cert bolt in uh, one of our weapons, so that she can actually see where the uh, round would print if she was actually pulling the trigger on, uh, on live ammo. So she can actually practice room clearing with her weapon as well throughout the house and practice these scenarios. Um, so with all that said, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, those that are out there would argue that we don't need, you know, what they would call, again, and I think it's a misnomer, an assault rifle, because it's not an assault rifle, it's a carbine. You can't remember I said it earlier, you know, back in the Civil War, when all they had was one shot musket, and what, musket well, that was an assault rifle then. Um, it just improved over time. But uh, those that would argue that she doesn't need it or that uh, we as civilians don't need those types of weapons uh, obviously don't know what they're talking about. And uh, I am a light and heavy weapons expert. I'm a Green Beret. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time. My wife knows how to handle her weapons safely around kids. You know, and it had taken an exorbitant amount of training to teach her to do all those types of things. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and I'll quote uh, someone I talked to a little while ago, Rudy Reyes. Uh, some of you may know him as well. He's uh, a Marine Force Recon guy that's also been on television, you know, he said all it really comes down to is what? It comes down to training, responsibility, and maturity, and I can't, you know, I have to agree wholeheartedly on that. And uh, so what we have is a situation where, you know, this is a case where, and it could be many cases where, you know, a weapon of this type um, is useful and is actually more practical than, say, a handgun. Not discounting handguns because, you know, they're tools for the toolbox, but, uh, you, know, you know, we have weapons and we have a Second Amendment and a right. Uh, rights in this country, not so much for um, self-defense, obviously, you know, that's, uh, you know, one of the benefits of having a weapon, but the other one is to protect us from a tyrannical government. Um, it reminds me of a, something I heard not too long ago on a, on a flight uh, from L.A. A gentleman got on board and he had two daughters that were about eight to ten years old and he was reading an article about uh, assault weapons again and, uh, and he kind of smirked and laughed. And I don't know if he did that on purpose to spite me or whatever, but he made the comment that, uh, you know, you can't stop tanks and uh, drones with those things anyway, so you don't need them. And I, and I started to comment on it and I thought, you know, just another ignorant, another ignorant civilian in our country, you know. I don't have to stop a tank or a drone with an AK-47 or assault rifle. That's not the point, all right. The point is, when I have a weapon like that, all I have to do is stop the driver. Um, you know, and this goes back to you know force multiplication, insurgency, insurgencies, and and coin operations. Um, you know, it's not about destroying the weapon or the tank or the aircraft. It's about dealing with the, the drivers, their support uh, network, their families. Uh, you know, when we talk about combat, we talk about war. Um, you know, it's not just about destroying the tank. It's also about destroying the operators on the other side of that thing. So, um, you know, they have narrow minds and it's narrow thinking, but at the end of the day, we know why we have the Second Amendment rights. It's to protect us from our own government. That's how all this got started to begin with in our country, you know, from England. And, uh, you know, having a weapon for self-defense, you know, again, that's just another, uh, you know, another ancillary, but another beneficial, another benefit to having a, a weapon.